We're starting a new series today, and the series is, is um, Witnesses of the Resurrection. Witnesses of the Resurrection. We want to look at people who saw Jesus alive, risen from the dead, and are evidence for us that the resurrection truly took place. Do you, do you ever have doubts about whether Jesus rose from the dead? Do you ever have doubts about God? Come on, some of you, if you're really honest, everybody has some doubts occasionally. Everyone wonders, didn't Paul, didn't John the Baptist, for example, he's about to die and he sends messengers to, to Jesus and say, are, are you the one? Why? Because he was wondering. Paul says, you know, look, I'm, I'm about to have my body poured out and I'm and, and do, still doing the things I don't want to do. But people have questions about the resurrection and, and about whether Jesus is God or not. In fact, in, in our society, isn't that one of the problems? Is that, we're, that people are like, oh, no, Jesus may have been a good guy, may have been a really good teacher, and we should really learn to do the things that he said, be nice to everybody, but yeah, he's not really God. And he didn't really rise from the dead. Uh, isn't our culture literally then doubting the resurrection of Jesus Christ? But here's the thing. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he's dead. You, you, you get that, right? If he didn't rise from the dead, he's simply dead, okay? Bodies in the, in the ground, in a tomb, in some place, who knows, if they stole it or whatever. The body, he, he's dead. If Jesus didn't rise from the dead, he's dead. What he said is dead. Think about this. The whole New Testament is dead. It has no meaning. It has no value at all. Why? Because right from the, the four Gospels, what are they all about? All about Jesus. All about the things he did what he taught, and they all end with a mission to, to go and tell other people that Jesus is risen from the dead. What's the Acts of the Apostles about? Acts of the Apostles. The Apostles are all going out and experiencing miracles and seeing the Holy Spirit at work and telling people Jesus is risen from the dead. The, the, the rest of the books of the New Testament, the letters, what are they? They're written to the church. The church doesn't exist if Jesus is dead. If Jesus is dead, he's dead, folks. Just that's all it is to it. There's no revelation of John. He doesn't get to see him coming back on the clouds. There's no Thessalonians, you know, the letter there that's saying, you know, uh, this is how he's going to come back and this is what it's going to be like. If Jesus is dead, he's dead, and folks, we're in trouble. Or at least put it this way, you might not be in trouble, but you're really wasting your time here this morning. And as Paul said in 1 Corinthians, we're, uh, if we believe he rose from the dead, we of all people are the most to be pitied. If Jesus is dead, he's dead. If he didn't rise from the dead, then the whole thing, folks, is just one big lie. And think about that one. Lies come out. <laughs> Have you ever noticed? Tell a lie, okay? And what happens? Eventually, it comes out. Now, one of the reasons why it comes out is because you can't keep your mouth shut. Right? So you tell your lie to somebody else. And then you're trusting them to keep it quiet. But the problem is when you tell a lie to somebody else, what do they do? They don't keep it quiet. Even though you tell them, okay, now this is a secret. Don't tell anybody. And what happens? That's like, a, that's like this secret message. Okay, I'm telling you a secret, therefore get ready to tell this to someone else. If he didn't rise from the dead, the whole thing's a lie. Now here's what's interesting about that fact is that if you remember that when Jesus rose from the dead, what did the religious leaders do? They paid off the Roman soldiers who didn't want to die because they would have. They would have been killed and they said, no, no, we'll take care of this. We'll take care of this with Pilate. You're not going to get in trouble because they somehow fell asleep while Jesus was in the grave that they were supposed to be watching. And while they were supposedly watching him, and while then the soldiers, the, excuse me, the disciples supposedly, with armed guard right out in front of the tomb there, supposedly came, moved this big rock quietly, of course, so no one could hear, and the soldiers wouldn't wake up, took the body away, and, and somehow that's how they've said he rose from the dead, because he didn't really rise. In fact, what happens? We actually know there's actually accounts that they were paid off to do that. Why? Because lies come out. But how about the disciples? 
If the disciples, don't you think that these guys were that were so afraid after Jesus was crucified, they're, they're hiding in an upper room, that they're so scared that they actually leave when Jesus is arrested. Don't you think that one of these guys, one of these people that we kind of label cowards and all the other kinds of things, don't you think one of them would have said later on, at some point in time, hanging upside down on a cross like Peter, somehow ready to be boiled to death, burned to death, killed, don't you think one of them would have said, you're right, it's a lie, don't kill me? But the problem is, it wasn't a lie. Jesus Christ rose from the dead. So not one of those disciples, nor the Apostle Paul, who is a whole other story that we're going to look at later, none of them say, oh no, it's a lie. He didn't really rise from the dead. If Jesus rose from the dead, guess what? You, you beat me to it. <laughs> if Jesus rose from the dead, he's alive. If Jesus rose from the dead, he's alive. If he didn't rise from the dead, what? He's dead. But if he rose from the dead, he's what? He's alive. <clears throat> so Luke 24, verse 33 says, They got up and returned at once to Jerusalem. There they found the eleven and those with them assembled together and saying, It is true, the Lord has risen and has appeared to Simon. Then the two told what had happened on the way and how Jesus was recognized by them when he broke the bread. Two men on the road to Emmaus. It's, they're, they're heading out to Emmaus. Why, why are they going there? They're a couple of disciples. They're, they're broken down. And remember, disciple doesn't mean apostle, okay? There's 11 apostles, there, and, and later we'll hear about the 11. But the, these are just some of the followers of Jesus. And there may have been 100 or more people in that upper room when they had that, that last meal where Jesus breaks the bread and says he's the body that's broken, and this is my blood that's shed for you. And then that night he goes out and dies on a, and gets arrested, and the next day he dies on a cross. If, if, here they are, he's walking with two of them, two, two of them walking to Emmaus. It's a seven-mile walk from Jerusalem. And as they're walking out to Emmaus, a man joins them. And he starts questioning about them, about their day. And, like, and they're like, you know, who are you? Where have you been? Everyone in Jerusalem knows that Jesus of Nazareth was crucified today. And they go on walking. This, this man starts talking about scriptures from the Old Testament, prophecies about the Messiah. And they're like, wow, this is special. And they get to the place where they're going to spend the night, and they sit down, and they invite him to stay, and so he stays, and then they ask him to, to bless the food. And you see, the meal begins with bread, right? Virgil, right, last night, bread. Didn't we have bread on the table? Isn't that where we began even before the appetizers got there? meals start with bread. And so what, is, what does he do? The, this man bless, breaks the bread and blesses it. And when he does that, it says that God opens their eyes and they see it's Jesus. And then he disappears. Now what happens with these guys? These guys are so excited about what has just happened uh, that they decide they got to go back to Jerusalem. Okay, they've just walked seven miles They've sat down to have dinner. could be 8 or 9 o'clock at night. Jesus, they realize it's Jesus there with them. And what are they going to do? Seven-mile journey back. I don't think they walked, though. <laughs> I just have this feeling that there had to be kind of a run. Okay, we got to go back. Why do they got to go back? we got to go tell the disciples. we got to go let them know. We've seen him. He's alive. This is amazing. we got to go tell somebody. And we're heading back to Jerusalem to do that. What would you do if you saw a dead man walking? Run, <laughs> tell somebody. There's, and, and so here, listen, look at what happens here. They were startled and frightened. While they were still talking about this, Luke 24, there's verse 36. Incidentally, that's the text for today is Luke 24, verse 36. While they were still talking about this, Jesus himself stood among them and said to them, peace be with you. They were startled and frightened thinking they saw a ghost. If, a, if you're in a room and all of a sudden we had a dead man walk in this room, somebody we knew had died, what would we all think? 
Maybe. Not if they're a zombie, Leslie. <laughs> if a dead person walks in the room that you knew was dead, you'd think it kind of strange. Okay? It, it would just be, it'd be kind of weird. And like, wh what is that? Who is that? Is that a ghost? And that's what these guys started wondering. The disciples, notice this. The disciples don't automatically, well, of course he's risen from the dead. That's what he told us he was going to do. Why are you surprised, guys from Emmaus, right? Yeah, these two gentlemen who just come back, who've, who've just met him, and, and they said, you know, he's, he's alive. Well, we know he's alive. That's what he was supposed to do. He told us several times that he was going to rise from the dead, so of course he is risen. Isn't that what they should have said? But it's not what they say because they're scared, they're frightened, they're amazed. They're, oh, no, how could this be? And then, oh, my, it gets better. Verse 38. He said to them, why are you troubled? And why do doubts rise in your minds? Look at my hands and my feet. It is I myself. Touch me and see. A ghost does not have flesh and bones as you see I have. And when he had said this, he showed them his hands and feet. And while they still did not believe it, notice this, watch out. While they still did not believe it because of joy and amazement, he asked them, do you have anything here to eat? And they gave him a piece of broiled fish and he took it and ate in their presence. Do ghosts eat? Do you, any of you remember Casper the ghost? Some of you are old enough to have grown up with Casper, right? <laughs> Wasn't that one of Casper's frustrations? He never could really eat. He couldn't drink. You know, maybe this stuff would go in that ghostly body, but he couldn't eat. He couldn't take I mean, Ghosts can't do that. And what does Jesus do? There are so many things that are happening here. We don't have time to go into all the details of this amazing thing about Jesus' resurrected body. First off, he just shows up in the room. How does that happen? Okay. By the way, these guys are behind locked doors. <laughs> They're in the dark. They're afraid. And Jesus suddenly, suddenly appears in the middle of there. He's the same guy that just disappeared from Emmaus. Wow, that body's pretty special, isn't it? But by the way, this is a resurrected body, right? And yet, look at this. He says, look, I'm hungry. Give me something to eat. He's already shown them his hands. And, he's, and by doing that, in fact, that may have been what, how the men recognized Jesus all of a sudden, too, back at Emmaus. Because he takes the bread, and as he does that, what do they do? They see his hands. Oh, my. And God reveals this is Jesus to them. And now here with the disciples, as he's starting to talk to them, and they're like amazed. I can't believe this. He's really here. He's risen from the dead. It can't be him. It's got to be a ghost. This is just crazy. And he says, okay, look, guys, look at me. And he shows them how he had been crucified. And he says, now, look. And, and I'm sure this is where he's even with Thomas. Okay, touch, feel, look. I am alive. In fact, guys, I'm hungry. I'm hungry. Do you have something to eat? And he takes some broiled fish and he eats the fish. Yeah, men risen from the dead that ghosts don't eat. But Jesus does. This is incredible. He just, he just came through the walls somehow. He just appeared here. And now he's sitting there and we can touch him. We can feel him. And he's eating with us. And they are marveling at this fact. And what does Jesus say? Why are you troubled? Why do you doubt? Why do you question? Why are wondering, could this possibly be true? And I love what it says next. It says that he opened the scriptures to them, verse 44. He said, this is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. Then he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will, will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day and repentance for the forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations beginning at Jerusalem. And you are witnesses of these things. What did Jesus do for them? He opened their minds so they could see and understand. Folks, uh, just, could I give you just a quick aside? If you're going to really witness to somebody and you really want to help them to believe in Jesus, pray that God opens their mind. Pray that God opens their mind. You're not the one who does it, by the way. 
You don't convict, you don't convince, you don't save, you don't do any of that. You're just supposed to be faithful. But God opens minds. Sadly, like Pharaoh, if you read in the Exodus, says that God closed the mind of Pharaoh when Pharaoh chose not to set the people free. And sadly, we can get to that place, and Jesus talked about this too, where God will actually close off a person's mind who simply chooses to reject God. So pray that God opens their minds. Jesus opened their minds. He opened the scriptures for them. And, he, and notice, he goes through the Old Testament because that's what he had. He didn't have the New Testament. Some of you are like, you know, I don't know the Bible well enough. It's because you haven't read the Old Testament, I guess. Right? We share what, what God has from the Old Testament. Here, in fact, as Jesus was talking to them, I'll take you back to Mark 8, 31. He then began to teach them that the Son of Man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and that he must be killed and after three days rise again. That's Mark 8, he told them that. The next day, he has another conversation with them, Mark 9, because he was teaching his disciples, he said to them, the Son of Man is going to be delivered in the hands of men. They will kill him, and after three days he will rise. You might remember, Peter says, no, you're not going down to Jerusalem then, Jesus, because, uh, in fact, I rebuke you, Jesus. You're not allowed to die there, and what does Jesus do with him? He says, I rebuke you, Peter. In fact, get out of here, Satan, because you're trying to interrupt the will of the Lord. Okay. Do you think they heard it? You're going to die? I think so. And then chapter 10 of Mark, verse 34, they will mock him and spit on him, flog him and kill him. Three days later, he will rise. Did Jesus tell them, I'm going to die and rise from the dead? Luke 9, 22, and he said, the son of man must suffer many things and be rejected by the elders, the chief priests, the teachers of the law, and he must be killed and on the third day be raised to life. Luke 18, they will flog him and kill him, and on the third day he will rise again. I don't think Jesus kept it a secret. He told him, I'm going to die and I'm going to rise again. He told him who was going to kill him. It was going to be the religious leaders. He told him he was going to be beat up, whipped, tortured, killed, and three days ri later rise from the dead. But they didn't get it. you want to know whether Jesus is the Messiah, if you want to help someone else know whether Jesus really is God, then you encourage them to pray a simple prayer. And you say, you know, you don't even have to believe that God hears prayer. You don't have to believe there's a God out there. But if there is, wouldn't you want to know it? And so why don't you take the risk and ask God to show you if Jesus is risen from the dead. And what does Jesus go on to say? In the rest of the text, we see that what, what's really important to Jesus, what really matters to Jesus <coughs> is repentance and the forgiveness of sin. Isaiah 53, he was despised. In fact, it, this is one of the texts I'm sure that as Jesus was talking with the disciples, he said, you know, let me explain some scriptures to you. Let me take you back to some of the ones that you've missed. Some of the ones that just didn't sink in. I think they're gonna, I think they're gonna speak to you differently right now. He was despised and rejected by mankind, a man of suffering and familiar with pain, like one from whom people hide their faces. He was despised, and we held him in low esteem. Surely he took up our pain and bore our suffering, yet we considered him punished by God, stricken by him and afflicted. But he was pierced for our transgressions, crushed for our iniquities. The punishment that brought us peace was on him, and by his wounds we are healed. We all, like sheep, have gone astray. Each of us has turned to our own way, and the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Do you think Peter and the other disciples are saying, oh my, that just happened? It's Psalm 22. If they're thinking now about him, what, what he was doing when he was hanging on that cross, listen to Psalm 22. Just a couple of the verses. To the tune of the doe, the morning, a psalm of David. 
my God, my God, why have you forsaken me? You said that on the cross, Jesus. Why are you so far from saving me, so far from my cries of anguish? All who see me mock me. They were doing that, Jesus. They hurl insults. Yes, insults. They're shaking their heads. They were shaking everything at you, Jesus. He trusts in the Lord, they say. Let the Lord rescue him. Oh, my goodness, Lord, that's what they said to you. Come on down. If God's going to save you. He trusts in the Lord. They say, let the Lord rescue him. Let him deliver him since he delights in him. All my bones are on display. You're naked out there, Jesus. Your bones were so gaunt. They were ripped apart. We could see your bones. It was horrible. People stare and they gloat over me. And they divide my clothes among them and cast lots for my garment. Prophecy from Psalms that comes true at the crucifixion of Jesus. What's important to Jesus? Repentance and forgiveness of sins. This is what I told you while I was still with you. Everything must be fulfilled that is written about me in the law of Moses, the prophets, and the Psalms. And he opened their minds so they could understand the scriptures. He told them, this is what is written. The Messiah will suffer and rise from the dead on the third day. And repentance and forgiveness of sins will be preached in his name to all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. You are witnesses of these things. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, he is not a good teacher. That's one of the things that, that people say, well, well, Jesus was a good teacher. No, he wasn't. He was a liar. If he didn't rise from the dead. Because he declares himself to be God. It's why they crucify him. That, look, blasphemy. He just used the name I am. He just said he's the Messiah. Isn't that what he said back when he, he took the man who was uh, on the mat, who couldn't walk, his friends dig a hole in the roof and drop him down by ropes. And as he's hanging there in front of Jesus, dust all over the place, what happens? Jesus looks at the man and he says, your sins are forgiven you. And what happens? The religious people in the crowd, like, he can't do that. They're getting all stirred up and all uh, uh, angry and upset. He can't do that. Why can't he do that? Because only God can forgive sin. So if he's forgiving sin, that means he's claiming himself to be God. They get it. They get it. And Jesus gets it too. And he says, uh, really? Okay, so let me prove to you that I have the ability to forgive sin. Sir, get off your mat, pick it up, and go home. Walk. And the man does what? Gets off the mat, stands up, and walks outside. And that's when I think the other four friends must have just lost it. <laughs> He's walking, look at what Jesus just did for him. To prove that he had the authority to forgive sin, he heals them. What is con Jesus concerned about? Repentance and forgiveness of sins. Jesus says, look, I'm alive. I'm the Messiah. I died for one purpose, to free people from their sin. So now go and preach repentance. Oh, there's a word you like to do, right? If you're going to preach repentance, what are you asking somebody to do? Admit that they've done something that they're guilty, that they may even be ashamed of. In fact, aren't you really asking them to, to follow the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous? You think about it. If you, if you know anything about the 12 steps of Alcoholics Anonymous, you will know that they really speak about a lifestyle, an ongoing lifestyle of repentance. I need to admit. I need to admit my weaknesses, that I'm powerless over alcohol, that... that my life has become unmanageable. I, I have come to believe that a power greater than myself could restore me to sanity. I've made a decision to turn my will and my life over to the care of God. That's repentance. 
And now look at this. And I'm making a search. I made a searching and fearless moral inventory of my life. If you're going to really examine yourself, that, that by the way, that's in step number four. Some people stop before they get there. <laughs> Got to make that moral inventory. <laughs> Do you open up to repentance? I've admitted to God. Now you're repenting to ourselves and to another human being the exact nature of my wrong. I'm entirely ready to have God remove all the defects of character. Okay, God, I'm repentant. Now you change me. I humbly ask him to remove all my shortcomings. I made a list of all the persons I harmed and became willing to make amends to them. I made direct amends to such people whenever possible, except where to do so would injure them. See, my confession is not supposed to be a confession that hurts somebody else. I continue to take personal inventory. The person who is repentant continues to look at their life, realizing they're not perfect and promptly admits when they're wrong. I sought through prayer and meditation to improve my conscious contact with God. I repented and wanted to get closer to God, praying only for his knowledge, for knowledge of his will and the power to cancel it, to carry it out. And having had a spiritual awakening as a result of these steps, I tried to carry this message to others. What does Jesus say? Go, be my witnesses. Jesus wants us to preach repentance. Yes, the world doesn't. Why does A, A, N, A, and all the other A's, why do they speak to so many people? Because at the heart, at the core of being is an understanding. There's something greater than myself, and there's something in me that needs healed. And the only way I'm going to get it healed is by something greater than me, and that's Jesus. So go preach repentance. And what does Jesus say? And I will forgive those who repent. Spurgeon said that <clears throat> Jesus began and ended his ministry with a message of repentance. Matthew 4, what do you say? Verse 17, from that time on, Jesus began to preach, repent for the kingdom of heaven has come near. How does it end? Matthew 28, go and make disciples of all nations, teaching them to obey all that I've commanded you, baptizing them in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. And lo, I'm with you always to the end of the age. It's a message of repentance. The, apostle, the apostles preached repentance. What did Peter say? The church is just being formed. This is the same Peter who had just denied Jesus in a courtyard or just, uh, just some, some weeks earlier. The same Peter who has really been afraid if Jesus is alive to see him. The same Peter that Jesus actually came and talked to sometime and then that talked to on the beach and said, Do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Oh, great. Do you do know that I denied you, denied you, denied you. This is that Peter. Peter who's, yeah, okay, he's all kinds of things, but this Peter says, repent and each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of your sins. You'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Chapter 319, this is all in Acts. Therefore, repent and turn back so that your sins may be wiped out. 531, God exalted him to his right hand as leader and savior to give repentance to Israel and forgiveness of sins. Chapter 11, 18, when they heard this, they ceased their objections and praised God saying, so then God has granted the repentance that leads to life even to the Gentiles. Even they're changing, even they're repenting and look what God's doing for them because they repent. Chapter 20, verse 21, testifying to both Jews and Greeks about repentance toward God and faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. 26, 18, Paul is right here giving his testimony. He says, to open their eyes so that they may turn from darkness to light and from the power of Satan to God so that they may receive forgiveness of sins and a share among those who are sanctified by faith in me. In verse 20, but I declare to those in Damascus first and then to those in Jerusalem and in all Judea and to the Gentiles that they should repent and turn to God performing deeds consistent with repentance. Jesus preached repentance, and he says, you guys go preach repentance. But don't stop there. You need to also preach forgiveness. In fact, forgiveness is at the heart of repentance. And that's what Jesus wants them to understand. So he says, you know, this is my blood. This is my blood of the covenant which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. That's, that's what he said as he's praying over the cup the night before he's crucified. I want you to experience forgiveness. Now, Isaiah 43, 25, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions. 
for my own sake and remembers your sins no more. That's forgiveness. God says, I'm going to erase your sin. Psalm 103, verse 11 and 12, for as high as the heavens are above the earth, so great is his love for those who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's forgiveness. Yeah, our sin cost Jesus his life. That wasn't cheap grace. It's extremely If he didn't rise from the dead, there's no forgiveness. And he says, you are my witnesses. These same men, <laughs> these, these 11 guys who have been doubting and questioning and afraid and, and really all over the place, these guys will now give up their lives because they believe it's true that he's risen from the dead. Go be witnesses of what? Here's something. God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. For God didn't send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him would be saved. That's forgiveness. Go preach that. You're witnesses of this. They were there when he said it. Verse 36, whoever believes in the son has eternal life, but whoever rejects the son will not see life for God's wrath. Jesus wanted us to experience life, eternal life, abundant life. So chapter 17, in his high priestly prayer of John, he says, now this is eternal life. What's eternal life? That they may know, that, that they may know you, the only true God and Jesus Christ whom you have sent. By the way, are any of you really looking forward to dying? I didn't say, are you looking forward to heaven? Are you looking forward to dying? Humans don't want to die. That coach that stood in front of the shooter did not want to die. He didn't go to work that day saying, I get to die today. He went to work saying, I'm going to do my best job. And he was given the opportunity to do what all teachers have as an opportunity, and that's to serve their students try to protect them and he did that with his life but he didn't want to die at the heart of humanity is this desire to live we're going to strive to give our energy the last moment and don't forget Jesus refers to death not as a friend but what as the last enemy to be destroyed who will be sent into the lake of fire the angel of death along with Satan Death is not what God wants for us. Life is what God wants for us. And how does he describe it? I want you to have eternal life. Jesus said to, to uh, Mary and Martha, your brother will rise again. Martha answered, I know he will rise again in the re res resurrection at the last day. But Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He who believes in me, though he die, yet shall he live. For he who believes in me will never die. And then he the question that's so important. This is the question for us to ask people. This is the question we have to answer ourselves. Jesus just said, I'm the resurrection and the life. I'm, I'm going to live forever and I'm giving you that opportunity. And then he asks the question, do you believe this? He doesn't say, did you ever doubt? But do you believe it? That Jesus is the resurrection and the life. Because he said, if you believe it and if you know that and you've experienced, then go be my witnesses. Go tell other people what you've seen and heard. You just saw me standing here in this room. You just saw me eat. You touched my body. You've listened to me talk. You know I'm alive. Go tell the world. And that's what they do. They go out telling the world. And that's our job too. Have you seen Jesus? Have you experienced Jesus in your life? Then go tell. It, your story of what Jesus has done for you. Go tell the world. Go let them know. P Peter did it. He says, Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. In His great mercy, He has given us new birth into a living hope through the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. I'm going to tell the fact that He's alive. 
John writes his whole book, what? So that people would know that Jesus is risen. Acts 4, 2, they were greatly disturbed because the apostles were teaching the people, proclaiming in Jesus, what? The resurrection of the dead. And with great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ. Go be my witnesses about the resurrection. And God's grace was so powerfully at work in them. You, you are witnesses. If Jesus is coming to your life, you are a witness of what God does when he changes somebody. There's one more slide and it emphasizes you. Jesus is in your life are called to be witnesses. Ecclesiastes 3.11 says he has made everything beautiful in its time. He has also set eternity in the human heart. Every heart hungers for life eternal. Yet no one can fathom what God has done from beginning to the end. 1 Corinthians says what no eye has seen, what no ear has heard, what no human mind has conceived the things God has prepared for those who love him. You are to be his witnesses. I've asked Virgil to share something that he shared last night at his uh, birthday party with his family. And so, Virgil, if you would please come. Uh, by the way, um, it was stated last night that uh, if you know Virgil, one of the things that Virgil's key words is obey. In fact, that's the answer you're supposed to give if, um, if he ever asks you a Bible question, the answer is obedience. Thank you, Pastor. I have to say that the last night, um, the children were sharing a beautiful vision of the son and wife and mother and children, the husband. get to walk away that way. <laughs> Love you. Love you too, Pastor. Thank you. I just had to hug you. That's all I meant. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> we are called to be his witnesses. Our witnessing begins in our Jerusalem. What's our Jerusalem? Well, Virgil's is seated, most, some of them on that back row. They're his family. Our Jerusalem are those people closest to us. We may live with them. They're our neighbors right next door. But we're also called to be missionaries, every single one of us, to be missionaries to go to our Judea, Samaria. And there are our Judea, Samaria. Who's that? Well, they're the people that are a little different than us. 
They may be somebody who, who lives in our community but speaks a slightly different language. Or, or uh, th they may be older than us or they may be younger than us. They may be more wild uh, than us or less wild than us. <laughs> they may have two ta tattoos and, and we may have the tattoos, but they're different than us. And then there is the world. Jerusalem, Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and the uttermost part of the world. And we're all supposed to be called to go. To go to people who don't know him. To call them to repentance and to invite them to experience forgiveness. And I do that today. You know where you're at with Jesus. I call you to repent. You know what you need to cleanse, what you need Jesus to cleanse in your life. You know the stuff no one needs to point a finger in your chest and point it out, but you do. Repent. Turn to Jesus and receive the forgiveness that Jesus wants to give you. And when you do, then go tell someone else. That's what a witness does. They simply say, this is what I experienced. This is what happened to me. This is what I saw. This is my story. Let's pray. God, thank you for the resurrection. We confess that there are times that we wonder and doubt its, its reality. There's sometimes we doubt your existence. There's sometimes we're not sure and we wonder, okay, what if this isn't true? Lord, thank you for so much evidence you've given to us that you did rise from the dead and that you are here right now. So Jesus, speak to our hearts. I pray that you would open up our minds for any of us that are close to you, even maybe right here today, that you'd open up our minds and, open up our minds and help us to understand and to 